Welcome everyone to our technical session, ArcGIS Online using Smart Mapping. My name is Julia Holtzclaw. I am a product engineer on the Living Atlas team. I work primarily with demographics and policy mapping along with my colleague here, Jim Harris. If you would like to introduce yourself. I sure would. I'm, as you said, Jim Harris. I'm a geographer. I work on ArcGIS Living Atlas as uh, an engineer. I get to make maps every day using smart mapping and enjoy it. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be here along with our colleague, Jeremy. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm Jeremy Bartley, um, Program Manager for ArcGIS Online and the, the JavaScript API. Focus on uh, the geospatial aspects of online and the visualization and the mapping. I uh, work on the smart mapping team, map viewer team. And um, uh, my background also is in geography, and I'm happy to be here. So our agenda for today. I'm going to quickly go over the many smart mapping styles, and then we're going to spend most of the time doing live demos. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you kind of understand how to take a fresh look at your data using WebGIS to explore within the map and really figure out what story it is that you want to tell. Um, smart mapping isn't a button or a tool. It's not automated map making. It's intelligent map recommendations. And we hope that you can use that to try out different map styles, reveal interesting things about your data, and use that to quickly make a great map. There's also a lot of customizations within um, smart mapping and the styles, including a lot of great new symbols, many color ramps, of which most are colorblind friendly, uh, labels, pop-ups, etc. So hopefully at the end of this, um, you'll have a good understanding of what smart mapping is and how you can use that to make great maps quickly. So what is smart mapping? As I kind of mentioned, it's a tool to symbolize and explore your data, the style, so to speak, of your map. So it gives you intelligent smart defaults based on your data. For example, if you have a uh, numeric attribute chosen, it'll probably give you um, the color or the size recommendation based on the values of your data. It's meant to help you explore and try out things in your data and to reveal patterns quickly that might be traditionally a little bit more difficult to configure. Um, and it only offers you map styles that work with your data type. You're not going to get you know, a color and size drawing style, which is for numeric attributes, if you're trying to map a, a string, something that's categorized data. So it helps kind of point the you know, the map maker in the right direction so that you don't spend as much time trying to figure out you know what's best, but you have a good starting point to take your map a step further. So some of the smart mapping styles, we have color and size, color and size, <laughs> compare A to B, um, relationship and then relationships with size, predominance and predominance with size, types, time, dates, uh, single location. So let me go through each of these individually. So visualizing one attribute, we just have location. So that's just your single symbol. You just want to know where you know, your points or your polygons or your lines are on the map. Then we also have types. So that's if you have categorized data. Um, you can visualize each of those different categories within your attribute as a unique symbol. We also have color, which is kind of your standard Corpweth map that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then we have size. So the larger the value is in your data, the larger the corresponding symbol will be on the map. Then we also have color and size. So this visualizes and compares multiple attributes. So in this case, two. So you're going to have one attribute, which is going to be in a color, and you're going to have another attribute, which will denote size. It's often used with um, a percentage and a count. So the percentage so showing the color, and then the corresponding count showing the size. We also have types and size. So you can take your categorized data and then also show a size based on um, if you have a corresponding size based on your category. 
So we have compare A to B. What compare A to B does is it shows a ratio between your first attribute and your second attribute. So it's either a ratio of A to B, so A as a percentage of B, or A as a per percentage or ratio of A and B. So perhaps um, you have acres of corn and you also have acres of soybeans and you want to compare those together or you want to compare your acreage of corn to the total of acreage of corn and soybeans. We also have dot density. So dot density takes your multiple attributes. So if you see in this example, it's uh, our different races and it takes the value and com converts that to a dot. So in this case, one dot equals nine people. So the denser the cluster of dots, the higher the values are in your data. So this is a great way to show, in this case, its population, but also things like uh, the farming example I just used. Um, and it's a very unique style that used to take if you were trying to do this traditionally, it would probably take you several days or potentially a week. In this case, smart mapping can do this for you pretty instantaneously. We also have predominance. So predominance takes multiple attributes. Again, here's another example using race data. And it on the map, it draws which is the most predominant value. So the highest out of all of your many categories, also known as you know, the most common. We also have predominant category and size. So using our predominance, we're trying to find the most common attribute. We can also sum those categories so you can actually see, okay, out of our two or three or up to 10 attributes, what is the actual total sum of those? How many people are there? What is the actual population? We also have abilities to visualize time. So we can do continuous timelines like this example where we want to see where things are built. So the lighter the color, the earlier the buildings were built, the darker the color, the later it was built. We can also show, you know, where are the oldest buildings. So we can use time and do uh, sizing with those dates so that we can show the oldest cluster of buildings um, that were built in the 1870s, like in this example, are in these areas. And the smaller points are for the buildings that were built more recently. So we can answer questions like, how long ago this, did this happen? How old are these points? Or how old are these buildings? We can also use themes. So when we're mapping color or size, um, we can show above and below above, below, center zone, or extremes. So this helps kind of filter out some of your data values. Not all of your data is important. You know, sometimes you might just want to focus on the outliers. Sometimes you just want to look at the bell curve and you don't want to focus on those outliers. That's what these themes are really useful for. And it also uses, um, instead of a continuous ramp where it's one color that goes from light to dark or vice versa, it's a divergent ramp so that you can see distinct colors for lower values and higher values. And so it really gives a different um, pattern to your map story. Using these themes, we can set thresholds in order to set what are your higher low values. And oftentimes it's gonna be centered on maybe an average or a national statistic or some sort of you know, magic number, as we like to say, it's what's important to your data. That's where your knowledge as the map maker becomes important. And so now let's go on and start exploring some of these smart mapping styles with uh, our demo. And I believe Jim is going to lead us off. Well, thanks, Julia, for getting us started. We're going to take you through some map calisthenics now. Do about five maps in, I don't know, 12, 13 minutes, something like that. We're going to do clustering, we're going to do size, we're going to do color, we're going to do color and size, and then lastly, predominance. Let's start with clustering. How many times have you ever fallen into this situation where you've got a layer with so many features that the number of points on this map is actually obscuring any pattern? 
present in the data. And that's it's kind of ironic if you think about it. Like the map should reveal, not obscure. And it's just the nature of the number of features at this particular scale. It's not a useful map. I don't care how small I make these points, we're still not get much signal out of this map. Now I've symbolized this by a attribute layer or an attribute called downstream hazard potential for this national inventory of dams. And if I choose this layer and choose the styles option, I can then close this and I get a lot more map space. I also uh, collapsed these labels for all the tools to give myself a little bit more space. So here we are, we've got this map, all of the dams are categorized into one of these four hazard potentials and the reds are obviously the ones that might be of interest. If I go to clustering and simply turn on clustering, the map gets instantly better. That's what I love about clustering. I can immediately go in and change the cluster radius. So maybe I want fewer clusters covering greater geographic areas or maybe I want more clusters, smaller clusters. In fact, you can go to a point where it's, okay, that's not useful, let's, let's dial it back. But the cost for me to try that out, it's minimal. You know, it's just an easy thing for me to try out. And that's, that's one of the things I love about smart mapping. It really shines when you're trying to explore and reveal patterns that traditionally are very difficult for you to configure in the map's properties and settings. You, know, you gotta go over here, click here, do that. In this case, there's just three controls here at work. There's the cluster radius, which says how many clusters do I want on screen? And then there's the size of the symbols. And the, if I take this handle, notice how the biggest symbols get bigger. And if I take this handle, the smallest symbols get smaller. And I think my general advice and the advice others would have as well is you want a symbol size that can kind of cover the label that's on top of it. Okay. Or maybe you just want to get rid of the label. Um, maybe you want to edit its contents. I think this label is particularly useful because it shows you how to, you know, put the count in with a K or an M for million um, behind it. That's where the 1.2K, the 1.4K comes from. Or maybe you even want to apply a filter to say, you know, only show me those labels where we have more than 200 features, right? You don't need to label it has less than 200 features. You can do all of those things. What I like about this um, is that this is multi-scale automatically. So as you zoom in, the clusters continue to be shown and they break apart. Like now this cluster of two, watch this cluster of two. It now is either absorbed into that or it reappears or it finally breaks apart into the two individual features. So you can click on that individual feature or you can click on a cluster and it'll give you the predominant value of that cluster here is low so the whole symbol is symbolized in green and then a lot of the other um, dams in the area they have a red color because most of the dams in those features is um, are rated at a high downstream hazard level so that's kind of a useful way to go another useful pattern is found in this atlas of the gross domestic product in this case from data from the bureau of economic analysis is used at the county level to show how important each county is to the U.S. gross domestic product. So big purple counties are contributing a lot, mid-tier counties are visible, and etc. They also have an interesting field that tells you how important each county is to its parent state. So Clark County is very important to Nevada and all the urban counties in California, they're a little more balanced in terms of their contribution to their state. You can see the patterns in other parts of the country. So how do maps like this happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. They all sourced from this layer, which I've added kind of in a bare bones manner to this map for this demonstration. So if I were to choose styles over here, because I have this new control here, I can close this panel and now just work on the right side of the screen because all my layers, including those layers used in the base map, are visible here. And I'm gonna map just a simple count. I'm gonna, I happen to know that we have a field called all GDP from all industries. If I want to I click on the information button to see what that definition is and some sample values, etc. So I'm gonna choose GDP from all industries and uh, I'm gonna choose the counts and amounts size style. Okay, and some of you may have noticed it didn't suggest, smart mapping didn't suggest this style at first, I had to switch to it. And that's because this field is stored as a float 
It's smart mapping sees a float. It takes a guess, hey, this is probably a rate, because things like percentages are often stored as a float, whereas counts and totals are usually stored as an integer. But hey, if it isn't the case, if your data is stored as a float and it's actually a total, like is the case here, no problem. Just choose that style, go in, you can start to change the color from either some presets, or if you want to, go into a color picker, maybe enter a hex value, an RGB value, or an HSV value. Uh, if you like a particular color, or someone's given you, you know, this is their corporate or brand color, you can save it for reuse in this session, and that's a very useful thing. So that's counts using size. I'm going to change this attribute. I'll type ALL. I'll put the cursor there. That'll help. ALL. And I'm going to get the percent of the state GDP from all industries onto the map. And at first, Smart Mapping says, oh, OK, this is definitely a rate. And I agree as the user, yeah, this is a rate. And uh, the default style is called high to low style. That's where we take a single color ramp and kind of smear that color from one standard deviation below the mean, which is 3.4, to one standard deviation above the mean, 6.8. OK, and uh, if you like this style, try it out. We also have other styles. Um, one I recommend a lot is the above and below pattern. And here's why. It lets you say sentences like this to your boss or the subject matter expert. When we use this map style, all the counties in blue are above the national average of 1.63%. All the counties in red are below that average. And then that person might say, no, 1.63 isn't relevant. What you really should be focusing on is any county above 5%. So you graciously accept that input and you change it. And the map instantly updates. And maybe they'll say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm totally interested in those counties that are not one standard deviation above the mean. I'm interested in counties that are, you know, 50% of their state GDP. Okay. And then next, once you get those numbers, those real world numbers incorporated in your map, now it's time to pick some colors. You know, GDP, money, I think greens right away. So maybe I might pick something like that or that or that. It's just easy to try on these different colors. Or maybe you're someone working with uh, a project where colorblind friendly maps are required. And we've got a ton of colorblind friendly color ramps in here. I'll choose this green to purple one as my example. So what is this map saying now? Well, now it's showing you all those counties in green are at or near 50% of their home state's GDP. So you can see how important LA County is to the state of California, Clark County is to Nevada, Maricopa County is to Phoenix, and so on. But wait, we're mapping a total, aren't we? Well, right now we're mapping a percent, but we also happen to know we have a total in our data set. So I can easily add GDP from all industries as a second attribute to map. And Smart Mapping instantly says, OK, well, whatever attribute is listed first, if it's a rate, like a percent, then this color and size map style is a great choice. Um, if you ever want to know what these styles are, just click on the information button. It'll suggest when you might use this. It says the first attribute you choose represent your numerical or ranked data, like a percent. And so now color, you can see from the legend, is based on the percentage of state GDP. In other words, how important is this county to its state's GDP? But we can easily compare the total GDP for LA County to the total GDP for Clark County, Nevada, in just a glance. And that's what's powerful about this map style. From there, you might start to tune it in. I'll just show you what I mean by tuning it in. I'm gonna change the size a little bit uh, we're going to change from a high to low theme for size to just an above. Let's emphasize all the data above the mean with size. And let's bump it up just a little bit. And then on the big end, if you change that to 120, it gives you some room. Watch the map and watch those mid-tier counties just suddenly emerge again out of the dots. So as I go to the right, you can see Indianapolis, St. Louis, Memphis, suddenly they appear stronger on the map, right? And that's what smart mapping is about, is helping you easily kind of fine tune the cartography with just a simple motion of the mouse to get this into a more readable format. And it's what I enjoy very much about it. Okay, lastly, 
think we have time for this. Yeah, we do. Let's go for a BAP style called predominance. So I happen to know that GDP is broken up into um, private industry, whether it's goods or services, and government, if I can spell it right. Um, GDP from government and government enterprise. If I add all three of those fields, it instantly responds with a default set of maps, default set of colors, rather. And we can see there's 2,291 counties where private industry services is the predominant source of GDP. Think like healthcare, things like that. I'm going to change the color ramp to something a little more, yeah, I kind of like that. But I'm going to reverse it. I'll tell you why. When I reverse it, this first color is applied to the first category who has the most features. And what that does to the map, see how the map is now basically um, the most common or predominant type of county is private services. It's now in yellow, and that allows some color room for the private goods and the government enterprises, the magenta and the green. It allows them to pop off the map a little bit more. And again, we know that this is a topic related to total GDP account, so we really ought to work size into the map. And when we do, the map instantly gets better by showing you little pockets of magenta, little pockets of magenta here, and then you can see interspersed a lot of smaller counties, their predominant source of income is government spending, which kind of, um, you know, depending on your uh, familiarity with the U.S. economy and how the government um, spends, that is consistent with what we um, might expect. Okay, so just in these few examples, we've been able to kind of see that smart mapping isn't a single button or a single tool. It's really about incorporating a way of thinking into your experience in ArcGIS Online Map Viewer to kind of help you explore the data, easily try out map styles that reveal interesting things, and then start to fine tune it based on what you know of the subject matter. Don't just accept the default values. Go do the research to find out, well, why are people looking at this subject and what are the significant values that they might be thinking about or that you can reveal in the map. It's more about focusing on your attributes meaning than setting tons of map properties in order to see a map for the first time. As you can see, once you kind of start working this way, you can continue uh, to refine the map as you go. Because you're the key, you're the sparkle light that directs smart mapping to illuminate what matters most in the data. But to illuminate it, you gotta discover it first. And that's what uh, we hope you'll find valuable here. Uh, I think Jeremy's got more examples uh, right now. All right, thanks. Um, let me just, I'd like to go through a couple of examples here. Um, I'm gonna highlight a couple of mapping styles. Um, the relationship style, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of exploration with the filter. Um, and um, I'm going to show you how uh, charts can now be used as part of your data exploration experience or communication experience. So I'll show you charts. And finally, I'm um, going to show you a new map style that uh, went in in April, um, a single, single variable above and below. OK, let's, let's drill into it first. So I've got this. Uh, these are census tracts in the US. You know, quite a bit of data. This is like uh, 70, um, uh, 71,000 uh, records and quite a, quite a few attributes that I can work with. And um, let's just get in there and explore this data. So this is my uh, layer that I've got selected, the layer I'm working with. And I'm going to hide this layer panel and get it out of the way because I can switch through to other layers up here in this experience. So I can get, get, that, get that out of the way. Let me focus on the work. Okay, uh, let's just dive in. And first we'll do um, a map of, show you what each of these looks like on their own. Um, map of diversity index. We'll just take the defaults here um, just to kind of get a feel for this data. So this is uh, areas in dark blue are areas that have very uh, high um, diversity. Areas that are very white um, have a single, single race dominating. Uh, let's look at, I have another variable here. 
just love the search feature, especially on these really small presentation windows. <laughs> It'd be hard to <laughs> read these uh, fields. Um, got percent minority population. Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> you know, a slightly uh, similar map uh, to the diversity index, but not exactly uh, the same. So how do we compare these two? Well, let's, um, Jim's already shown you um, predominance. Uh, I'm going to show you another one specifically for uh, comparing two variables it's called the relationship style. So let's add that diversity index back in. So I've got both variables and by default, smart mapping will pick um, color and size. <clears throat> And where one variable is the color and the other variable is the size. Um, we'll just skip that. Another way to compare just two variables would be this the comparison style. But I'm going to skip that for a second. And let's drop into this relationship style. Okay. So this allows you to compare uh, uh, visually two variables. Um, so I've got um, percent minority population and the diversity index. And these arrows here on this legend kind of give you a feel for what's low and what's high. But I want to tweak this map just a little bit more uh, before we go and explore it. First off, I want to go ahead and um, change it to a 4x4 four four grid. Adds a little bit more variation. Um, doesn't always work because it uh, can make it more complex to understand. But um, if we look at how these uh, variables uh, look, so I see the histogram here of the percent minority population, a classic, uh, you know, um, distribution here, high on both ends. I'm just going to go ahead and since we're dealing with percentages or an index, I'm, that goes from zero to a hundred. I'm just going to make everything, uh, 25 equal. And, uh, basically this is how, uh, this relationship style works. So, uh, this zero to 25 here is going to be the low one for percent minority population. So that's going to be down here. Let's look at the other variable diversity index. And just for, just for comparison, I'll keep the same percentages, but you know, this is, this is can really, um, affect your map. So you want to explore it and get a good feel for your data, understand your histogram, apply good smarts. Um, if you have specific numbers that mean specific policy things that people understand. So uh, now here, this uh, 0 to 25 um, now represents diversity index. So if it had the 0 to 25 on diversity and 0 to 25 on percent minority, you would be in this yellow class here. Okay, I got that done. Now, actually, the area that I'm really most interested in, and maybe we should just look around the map a second, go into a city, um, get a feel for this data. So uh, here we have very low uh, diversity index and low minority population, but here it's the opposite end of the spectrum. It's this uh, high blue here. Um, this means it's it's uh, got a high percent minority population, but a low diversity index. So it's not uh, not a very diverse area. It's a single race area, but in this case, it happens to be a minority race. Whereas in uh, northern Kansas City, Kansas City, Kansas, it's more mixed. You have a um, you know high diversity index and a high um, percent uh, minority. Now this. Uh, this legend allows you to have a little bit of control over it. Actually, I think this is the kind of the interesting area. Or, um, well, there's a lot of interesting areas for this map. For the sake of this conversation, I'm going to say areas that have a high percent minority population and a low diversity index are interesting. So I want to focus it to be the high, what shows up at the top. So essentially, I'm going to rotate this grid around. So I want to pick the high low. There we go. So now my, my blue, um, is a focus at the top. And, you know, I definitely strongly recommend you, you, uh, add some contextual labels so that people don't have to really read and understand that, uh, legend. But I can say something like, um, uh, high percent minority, low diversity index. Now you got to get tricky with it because it's going to take up a lot of space. So 
coming up with a good text that describes that in as least amount of words possible is, is a good is a good thing. Um, okay, so that's kind of interesting. And uh, let's go back out to this uh, nationwide level here. And I um, want to explore this data a little bit. So if I drill in to the filter, and let's just filter on um, diversity index. I've got that nice handy um, filter experience. What's pretty uh, awesome is that you get instant feedback. And this is what Jim was talking about earlier. Um, and this allows you to really visually control uh, what your users are gonna see. And it makes for a really fast authoring experience. Um, I'm not going to do too many other filters because I want to show another new way to explore this data, and that's with charts. So we've added the ability to create charts here, and I can create um, several different ones. I could create, well, let's say, a histogram, and uh, let's just do the same diversity index here. <clears throat> I get that same... Uh, uh, view that we saw in the smart mapping experience. I have control over the colors. I can apply uh, what's the normal distribution. If it wasn't a normal distribution, I can apply some transformation. You know, you have quite a bit of control here. I'm going to go back and add this last chart, so scatter plot. And on the uh, x axis, uh, I want to do percent minority population, and on the y-axis, the diversity index. Let this chart come down. Yeah, there we go. Pretty interesting uh, chart visual, and actually it makes sense if you think about it based on how we broke up that, uh, uh, broke up those classes in the relationship style. First thing off you should notice, it applies the color of the map, that's cool. So here on the x-axis, we got percent minority population, and on the y-axis, diversity index. So this area in blue was the interesting one that we were just looking at. Let's just highlight those. And when I highlight on the chart, I see those areas highlighted on the map. So I can go in and explore what that looks like, whether it be in Chicago. Uh, up in Detroit or uh, Cleveland area. So yeah, pretty interesting. Pretty good way of exploring um, your data kind of fast and interactively. Um, got one other style I'd like to show. And let's go back to the Kansas City area since I'm more familiar with this part of the country. Okay. Um, I'm going to close this, and I want to work with this other data set that I've got. This is housing information by census tract. And um, let's just flip to that layer. And uh, sorry, get into the map style. And uh, this has uh, percent change in owner occupied households from 2000 to 2020. So I enrich this data with the geo enrichment tools in the classic map viewer. Um, well, let's select this variable. It's a pretty interesting one. So, um, not much to see at this, at this, uh, at this scale here. And, uh, but let's explore some of these other mapping styles. So I can use color or I can use uh, size. Or I can apply both the same variable to both both color visual variables, both color and size. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I picked the wrong one. <laughs> Here we go. Now I picked the color and size. <clears throat> See my legends changed. I've got a size variable along with color. Uh, the default experience is not is, is not what I really want to show you because I really want to show you some of the themes that are in here. And a new uh, at the April release this year is this above and below style theme. 
And notice what we've got on the legend here. Uh, let's scroll down. First off, we're using a third visual variable, the shape of the legend feature. Let's scroll in so we can see it a little bit better. Um, to indicate things above and things below zero. Now this uh, is highly skewed, of course. So let's get this into more um, things that make sense. Let's set it to 200 and go ahead and set the top to 200. All right, there I've got my nice histogram close to centered around zero and zero is the inflection point. So above that, you're going, as you get farther away from zero, you're gonna get a bigger size and it's gonna be colored blue. Um, as I get farther away um, below zero, uh, it's gonna get bigger as it grows. Now, one tricky uh, thing with this style, well, first off is just like before, you have control over uh, how the sizes are displayed. What are the min and max sizes? Let's get just kind of zoomed into this Kansas City area. So I can control what's the overall size difference. I can also control how um, uh, how the data is mapped to size. So before I do that, I want to call out this new spider here and new legend. So uh, 200 is uh, twice as much as 100. So um, this slider keeps the sizes correct. So this caret at the minus 100 is actually half the size of this caret at uh, above 200. Now watch what happens as I move this slider down to 100. Now they're exactly the same size. Uh, so this uh, is a really nice enhancement to keep your maps correct while still allowing you to visually explore that data. And you get a pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting map. And if it's even more interesting, if you apply some other variable on it on context, so you can see where we've had major house drops. Um, I guess another couple of things is you have different options here for the symbol pairs. Maybe you want to go with uh, closed circles, open circles. Um, same thing for squares. Maybe you want to do uh, arrows with circles. It helps them stand out a little better. Um, or even like just straight up triangles, going up and going down. So this is a pretty uh, interesting style uh, that I'm pretty excited that uh, we have it out there. And we think you guys are going to make some great maps with it. I think Jim, um, Julia, anything you want to add? I just think that's super cool with the, uh, the scale that it keeps the legend correct. Um, I know that's something that uh, cartographers that have been in the business for a long time are going to be really excited about, uh, that it's actually visually accurate because no one wants to have to go make a custom legend. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoy how these tools all allow the person working with the data to focus on what, what's the message they're trying to communicate. You know, what are the significance of the numbers? And uh, that's what I appreciate most about smart mapping. It's always trying to encourage you to find those significant numbers out in the literature or from your own subject matter expertise and bring those numbers into the legend. And that's where all the magic happens when you bring those numbers that have meaning in the real world bring those into your map, you know, um, suddenly it kind of jumps to life. Definitely. All right. That's it for my demos. Pass it back. Thanks, Jim and Jeremy. Those were great examples of all the many, many different smart mapping styles and how to use those to kind of try on different uh, styles for your map while exploring your data. Um, to close out here, I want to show a few of the different symbols and techniques you can use um, that are fairly unique, maybe possibly underutilized, um, that can make your map um, just stand out a little bit above the rest. So if we look at this map that I have here, it's showing the percent minority population without health insurance and the count of minority population. So as you've seen, this is a kind of standard color and size map. But what might look a little different are the symbols that I'm using. Um, 
this uses kind of a plus sign versus the standard circle, possibly square or triangle that you might be used to seeing. So if we go look at our style in here, and let's just say for sake of argument, I uh, was to change this back to one of our more often seen basic shapes. What I'm getting right now is kind of what I call a blobby map. Obviously, we would need to adjust some of these breakpoints and some of these sizes because we're really not getting any clarity in here. Um, it just kind of, you can't differentiate between the different counties. And in my map, I'm showing the percent without health insurance and also the count. Now, the problem with this map as it is now is it's rewarding the urban areas, the places with higher population. But that doesn't mean that areas that possibly have a high percent, which is you know, the normalized value, but even though they have a lower count, should be any more ignored. You know, if you look at these areas up in the North Midwest, you know, they have a small population, but they clearly have a high percent without health insurance. So I still want to reward these areas and have them stand out without it looking like your typical population map. And so how I do that is by going to the plus for the basic shape. This and the little kind of cross X marks the spot here um, aren't often used, but when I click that, see the kind of effect that it has. No longer do I just see a bunch of big circles that are overcrowding the map, but I can actually see like the bright yellow higher percent of the population that don't have health insurance are really standing out. And we're not rewarding these big urban centers as, as much because they're not this, this big thick circle is no longer covering the neighboring counties with smaller populations that you know, are also part of this story. There's also another map I have, and this is um, showing another health insurance map. And this uses the diamond symbol. Again, a little bit different than what you may be used to seeing. Now, this symbol is part of a new set of symbols for the new map viewer. So if we go back into our change style here, we look at our symbol style. So instead of choosing one of the basic shapes, we have all these vector symbols. Um, the symbol pairs are what you saw earlier when Jeremy was showing the you know, above and below. And I'm going to take a look at these shapes. So these are some new shapes that we have. Some of these are kind of similar to what currently exists for the basic shapes. But we also have this diamond, so it's a little bit skinnier, a little bit more refined than your standard kind of more square diamond. We also have kind of this thicker plus sign. We also have um, a pentagon right here. So here is another example that uses one of those new um, new symbols as the hexagon. This is a map of the gross domestic product layer that Jim had shown earlier and it's showing manufacturing. And manufacturing kind of reminds me a little bit of factories, machines, you know, you're building things. So a hexagon kind of is like a gear, maybe. And so it's, you know, related to the map topic, but it's a unique symbol. So not only is it related to the topic that I'm mapping, but it's also a little bit more eye catching and it stands out more than your standard circle or square might. So I really encourage you to check out some of these new uh, symbols that we find in our symbol style clickers right here because it could really just be that little extra cartographic, you know, cherry on top of, you know, the Sunday to make your map stand out. So thank you all for listening to our presentation. I know Jim, Jeremy, and I had a great time showing you all these fun new things that are in the map viewer. And now we will be opening up for questions.